I recently made a video about four stocks that I added to in my portfolio. One of them was a high growth medical device company called Semwar Scientific. I asked if there was any interest in me doing a deep dive into that and the overwhelming response was yes. Of course, as soon as I added to my position, shares immediately plunged in response to a disappointing fourth quarter results. But in this video, I want to cover everything you need to know about Semware Scientific, including my updated thoughts. My name is Brian Feraldi. This video is sponsored by Quarter. So Semler is a very small company trading under the ticker symbol SMLR with a market capitalization that's currently about $320 million. Semler's mission statement is a bit long, but essentially what this company does is it helps to evaluate and treat chronic diseases. Specifically, this company is currently focused on PAD or peripheral artery disease. Now, what is PAD? PAD occurs when cholesterol and other fats that are circulating in the blood Blood collect on the walls of the arteries that supply blood to your limbs. Now this buildup creates plaque that leads to the narrowing of the arteries, which can often lead to reducing or blockage of the flow of blood completely. Now, unfortunately, PAD is an incredibly common disease. There are currently about 20 million Americans that suffer from PAD. However, this is a very underdiagnosed condition. Only about one to two million people are diagnosed conventionally each year. Now that's a big problem because if you have PAD, you definitely want to know about it. People with PAD have a 21% increase in their likelihood of having a heart attack, stroke, hospitalization, or even death. Now here's the reason why PAD is so underdiagnosed. 75% of patients who have it are asymptomatic. That means they don't have any conditions whatsoever that would indicate that something is wrong. Now the current standard of care for diagnosing PAD is called an ankle brachial index or an ABI test. This is when you use a blood pressure cuff and a Doppler ultrasound imaging to detect PAD. Now this has been the standard way to diagnose PAD for years. However, it's a bit impractical because it's a slow procedure. It requires extensive training to do, and it just isn't practical or fast enough to be used in a primary care setting. So Semler is trying to make diagnosing PAD far easier than it is today, and their solution is called QuantaFlow. Now QuantaFlow is a five minute test that can happen during a routine medical exam. And the way that it works is this little alligator clip goes on the patient's feet and the hands. And within about five minutes, the physician gets a report that shows how blood is flowing to each of their extremities. In essence, because of its speed and ease of use, this makes diagnosing PAD way faster and easier than it is to do conventionally. Now, Semler just released data from a nearly 14,000 patient study that they did using QuantaFlow. And what they found was that about 31 1% of people that were tested in QuantaFlow were positive for PAD. So QuantaFlow is doing a far better job about diagnosing PAD than conventional metrics. Now, what I love about Semler Scientific as an investor is the company's business model. Rather than focusing on selling the devices themselves, the company only makes a tiny fraction of its revenue from the clip itself. And the vast, vast, vast majority of the sales actually come from the software. So it either gets a recurring monthly payment or a variable payment for using the reports. What I also like about this company is it sells its products through insurance plans rather than going from the, to the doctor's offices themselves. That means this company does not have to spend a lot of money on sales and marketing. And since it is a medical product, demand for this product tends to be recession proof. And because this company is focused on a software model, the vast majority of its revenue is recurring. As for Moat, I think one of the major competitive advantages of Semler is its switching costs. Once an office gets set up using this technology and builds it into their workflow, it can become a bit of a pain to take it out, especially given how useful it is for speeding up the diagnosis of PAD. Like all medical companies, the company also has some patents that are protecting it. It's not so much protected by its brand name, although perhaps you could make an argument that the name QuantaFlow is building up some brand loyalty within the medical community. I'm not gonna make that argument myself. You could also make the argument that there is some counter positioning here too. Since the company focuses on software sales as opposed to the hardware sales, that is different than the current way that PAD is diagnosed. 
although it's hard to gauge just how strong that counter positioning could be. However, the uses for this technology and the number of users is growing, so I do think the moat for this company is expanding. Now, one thing I love about Semler is it has dreamy financial statements. Uh, revenue growth has been very strong uh, since it came public and recently reached $53 million in 2021. That was up substantially over the year ago period. Because this company is selling software, it has very high margins, 88% gross margin in the most recent year. It's also highly, highly profitable. It generated $17 million in profits last year on just $53 million in sales. So this business is highly efficient at turning revenue into profits. The same can be said of free cash flow. The company does a great job at converting that net income into free cash flow. And since it's been profitable for years, its balance sheet is in fantastic shape. $37 million in cash, zero debt, and this company also has high returns on capital. So from a financials perspective, Semler is in fantastic shape. Turning to management, this company was founded by Herbert Semler more than 20 years ago. He retired from the company in 2012. He turned over the reins to Dr. Douglas Murphy Jeturin, who has been the CEO since 2012. Now this is a very small company, so the Glassdoor reviews are not that reliable, but overall the company seems to get good scores so far, although that's with only seven ratings, so take that with an extreme grain of salt. But we do know that insiders own about 13% of the company. As for long-term potential, management believes that there is a tremendous amount of space for Quantaflow to grow. But what's interesting about this company is it's made a few investments in the last two years that open up new revenue opportunities. Now, the company recently revealed two of its investments that it's made. One is in a software product called Insulin Insights, which are designed to provide practitioners of people with insulin-dependent diabetes with insights into how to manage their disease. Now, the company has already signed up a handful of customers for this product, and they could start to become revenue in 2022. So that is certainly exciting. The company also made an investment in a private company called Synapse DX, which is working on diagnosing Alzheimer's disease. So I like that optionality in this business. As for operating leverage, the company is already so profitable, I have a hard time seeing the operating leverage kicking in to produce higher profits, so that is actually a negative. As for addressable market opportunity, this number is somewhere around $1.8 billion, of which the company has captured about 3%. And so far, all of the company's growth has been organic in nature, although it's worth noting that the investments in Insulin Insights and Synapse DX were obviously not organic. Now, despite this stock getting clobbered recently, this has actually been a very good performer since this company came public. It has smashed the S&P 500 since its IPO and especially over the last five years. Now, as far as exceeding Wall Street's estimates, the company missed in the last two earnings reports, so it is two for four on that front, and it is not focused on returning capital to shareholders as of yet, although I for one would certainly support a stock buyback, especially at today's prices. Now turning to risks, there are a few to keep in mind. Uh, first and foremost, the competition is still there while this is mostly displacing an older technology, and I think the competition is fairly low. There is the potential that I could be overlooking something and a competitor could come to market that has an even better mousetrap than the one that someone has created. Now, the big risk to me to watch here is concentration risk. As of the third quarter of 2021, one customer accounted for 40% of quarterly revenue and another was 28% of revenue. So this company has some big time customer concentration risk that needs to be looked at. Now, those are not the end users themselves. Those are likely to be the health plans that have the Medicare customer customers uh, in them, but make no mistake, the loss of any of their major customers could be catastrophic for this stock. So while customer concentration is the biggest risk, I don't see a ton of risks beyond that, and even the valuation seems to be pretty reasonable. So shares are currently trading hands for about six times sales and roughly 25 times forward earning. So this company is not currently priced for high growth. So given everything I just said, why the heck did this stock just get clobbered when it reported fourth quarter results? Well, I'll cover that next, but before I do, I wanna give a shout out to this video's sponsor, which is Quarter. Quarter's mission is to make every interaction between companies and their investors meaningful. Quarter does so by providing frictionless access to conference calls, investor presentations, transcripts, and earnings reports from markets all around the world, straight to your pocket for no cost. If you're interested in giving Quarter a try for free, yes, free, simply visit the app store of your choice and search for Quarter. That's Q-U-A-R-T-R. -R. All right, so why did this stock get clobbered when it reported fourth quarter results? 
Well, I think the answer can be found in the headline. Stemler actually reported a revenue decline of about 4% in the fourth quarter to $11.5 million. I think that took the market by surprise. It certainly took me by surprise. Now, what was up with that? Well, management believes that its revenue was impacted due to COVID-19, and that's because a sizable amount of the company's revenue comes from variable fee licensing. And the company actually thinks that a new pattern that's emerging because more people are using this in their home is that revenue in the back half of the year is going to be slower than revenue in the first half of the year. The company actually provided investors with some data around this. They noted that variable fee licensing, which is fee per test licensing was actually up 87% in January of 2020 as compared to December of 2021. So there's going to be some seasonality in the company's business moving forward. So I think this news really took the markets by surprise. It certainly took me by surprise and that management did a really, really poor job about communicating this information to investors. And I think this number spooked them into believing that the company's growth is essentially done. However, they also showed that in the month of January, monthly fixed fee licensing revenue was up about 13% and variably fee licensing was up about 6% year over year. So, so far into January, the company's upward trajectory of revenue growth has continued, albeit at a slower rate than we've seen recently. So I view the big decline as an expectation reset and really just a poor job by management to communicating what actually happened. So what should investors watch from here? First and foremost, keep an eye on that revenue number. We want to see revenue continue to move up and to the right, especially as we enter a post-COVID world. Second, keep a close eye on that customer concentration. We want to see that concentration issue decline over time as Semler continues to sign up new customers. And three, we want to see signs that those new products are being launched and they're having success in the marketplace. So in response to this quarter, I actually knocked a couple of points off the company score on my investing checklist. However, I still think this is a highly investable idea. On Brian Stoffel's checklist, this is in the robust category, but just barely. That's largely because of the company's customer concentration issues, which he scores much, much harshly than mine does. So overall, I'm definitely disappointed in Semler's fourth quarter results and especially how management communicated that to investors. However, I still think this is a very, very high quality business and I personally have no plans to sell my shares anytime soon, but I'm not gonna be in a rush to add. I would rather wait a couple of quarters to see how the company evolves from here before I made any decisions about adding or selling this position. Well, I hope this video was helpful and shows why it's so important to diversify. I think that Semler is a good company with a bright future ahead, but I admit that I could be wrong. Brian, out.